Hi there. I was asked by the training division to talk about rebreather diving briefly for the purposes of this dive emergency video. This is a closed circuit rebreather. This is my own personal one. This is a Megalodon. There are several manufacturers out there. They all kind of do the same thing. They're a bit different looking and a little bit different functioning, but the, the end result is the same. Uh, it's a completely different tool than your average scuba diver would use. By that I mean they, they breathe their gas out of a tank that's got a regulator. When they exhale, all those bubbles go into the water column and they're gone. This device is meant to be quite miserly and to get through uh, the dive with as little gas loss as possible. In other words, you're not exhaling to the water column like you are with uh, a regular scuba tank. Um, what this does is this has a circuit or a loop breathing loop that actually becomes part of the diver. The diver's lungs and airway are in that loop. And uh, then the, the, the device has a one-way valve in the mouthpiece here. So gas on this one, the Megalodon goes right to left. It breathes right to left. Some breathe left to right, just depends on the brand. Um, what you're seeing here is the, the rubber hoses that go to the head and the plenum that have the mouthpiece. And that's hooked up, I'll pull this up, to these two bags under here. And those bags are known as counter lungs. This is the expiration counter lung. This is the inspiration counter lung. On the expiration counter lung, we also have an, uh, an automatic and manual diluent valve so that diluent gas which is carried in this cylinder over here. This one happens to be 1447 Trimix. It's a blend of gas. I blended it up for it. That is 14% oxygen, 47% helium, and the balance would be nitrogen. And that's so that I don't get nitrogen narcosis going, you know, deep. Uh, nitrogen narcosis is, uh, you know, an, a level of intoxication that gets worse and worse the deeper the diver goes. So you want to get some of that nitrogen out of your breathing mix, and the way we do that is we add helium to it. So this is a Trimix blend here. This is the diluent valve. You can actually add gas. If you notice that your PO2 is really high and you needed to dilute that down, you could add gas here manually, uh, diluent gas. And then if your PO2 was low in the loop, as seen on your handsets or your computer, you can add manually add oxygen. This is a, bl a, a blow-off valve here. If you got too much gas in the loop rather than rupturing something, this valve will pop and that excess gas pressure will go overboard. This is for off-board gas over here. If you're carrying a an extra cylinder of diluent on you, you can plumb that in over here. So uh, that's just a, an extra gas hookup over there if, uh, if you need to carry extra gas. This is the uh, inflator for the buoyancy compensator, which is this, uh, this inflatable bag that's on the back here that gives the diver uh, a buoyancy control at depth as well as positive uh, buoyancy on the surface. This is waiting to be picked up by the boat. Um, this is the, uh, the right hand set. This uh, will give the, the diver an uh, indication of uh, the health of the gas that's in the breathing loop by looking at the PO2. On the breathing loop here with the one-way valve, what's known as the diver's surface valve, which has a valve that can be closed to keep the seawater out of it if it's not in the diver's mouth, which it's always supposed to be if he's on the surface. Um, and this, this right here is a heads-up display, and it, it will warn the diver with a visual cue that he's got a problem developing in his breathing gas uh, loop. And uh, green is good, yellow is not so good, red is really bad, so... Uh, you know, you need to, to, to keep an eye on that. Um, on the back side of this thing, you can just get a better view of the plenum. Better view of the plenum back here. This is where the, the, the head mounts to. That's the brains of the unit. This is the heart of the unit where the CO2 is removed from the exhaled uh, breathing gas and trapped in here so that you don't become hypercarbon and wind up with a a driver emergency as a result of that. So I'm going to take this unit apart so that you can see the components of it and uh, and we'll also talk about maybe what some of its weak points are and what some of the emergencies that could develop uh, 
uh, as a result of, of using one of these. Um, a lot of really good divers have perished diving with these devices because one reason or another they didn't keep an eye on their breathing mixture or, or, or some other uh, mechanical mal malfunction developed that they didn't uh, they, they weren't aware that it was happening um, there's really only one malady that can happen here without warning and that's high co2 that's if the scrubber the granulated material that you pack into the scrubber which I'll show you in a minute um, fails or is channeled and CO2 makes its way back into the breathing mixture to a dangerous level. In that case, then the diver can have a, a, an emergency from hypercarbia. Uh, that's about the only one you don't get any warning on. Uh, the, the PO2 is available on your heads up display and on both wrists and so it's fairly simple to just take a glance at that every so often and make sure that your PO2 is within range. And that the rebreather is mixing gas as it's designed to do. Um, there are a few other emergencies that I'll go over once we take the unit apart. Okay, here's the unit all taken apart. Um, start with these, these are the counter lungs. I showed you, you get a pretty good view of them here. It's the offboard gas uh, valve, high pressure valve, onboard oxygen, and onboard diluent valves. So the counter lungs. These are slightly modified uh, conventional scuba regulators. This one here is diluent. This other one is for the oxygen. And they each have a gauge the diver can has hanging over his chest. You can flip them up and take a peek at your gauges if need be. This is the uh, scrubber I was talking about. Um, this, this little canister right here uh, is what you pack with the soda sorb material and uh, you hand pack it you very carefully vibrate it down and make sure that it's totally packed so that you don't have any channels running through here any any channels can allow uh, exhaled uh, breath to go up through the canister and the co2 to escape back into the breathing loop you don't want that you want that co2 to go right into here and be trapped and uh, so that you can uh, not have uh, an emergency as a result of hypercarbia. So this is this is sort of the, the part of the rebreather that that's really important, and it's also the one that you can't really very well monitor. So you have to make sure that when you do your pack job on this, that it's correctly done. Um, this is the diluent cylinder. This is the oxygen cylinder, pure oxygen, and whatever diluent you choose for the dive you're going to make. This is the breathing loop. The mouthpiece is on the is on the breathing loop and the heads up display hooks into this thing right here. This is the head of the rebreather brain. Has uh, two battery compartments on it, one that runs a handset and set and the other one that runs a board for the other handset as well as the, the computer here. And uh, so there's battery compartments. And then this center piece right here that's the that's the carrier and it's called a carrier because it carries these three uh, oxygen sensors and these oxygen sensors have a, a waterproof membrane in there to keep moisture out of them and what these do is there's a galvanic uh, chemical that resides inside here in a little electronic board and what these do is when oxygen comes in contact with this membrane inside the breathing loop, it triggers a galvanic response in here that produces some millivolts of electricity. That electricity then travels down to either of the two handsets where it's converted from a, a electrical millivolt reading into pro, a partial pressure of oxygen. So if you're shooting to have a, a PO2 on the dive of uh, 26 percent you know that if uh, if you're looking at your handsets it should say you know you're at 26 percent it's not at 26 percent then you need to take action on it it's really high that can cause a problem called uh, hyperoxia which is oxygen is toxic at depth underwater so um, very important to keep an eye on the po2 at all times um, this, uh, this head 
uh, is also where the breathing hoses hook up to. So you, you can see a diver uh, have an emergency on this, uh, on one of these devices. So uh, it's really sort of treated, you know, symptomatically, of course, but uh, we won't go into the, the DCS or the treatment modes of any. We'll just tell you what can happen because I believe that in another part of this video, they're going to talk about all that. So don't want to be redundant on that. The other thing we got in here is, uh, is a spacer that resides in the bottom of this thing. And uh, there's some uh, water absorbent material uh, that goes into these grooves here that stays in there. And that's to keep any water that might get in, though this, this sucker really breathes dry, um, that might get into the plenum, okay? Because that can cause a problem too. Seawater, if it makes contact with this, becomes caustic soda. And, and it's known in the rebreather lingo as a, a caustic cocktail, meaning that if, if you get seawater enough in here, for one thing, the gas won't circulate. For two, it'll pollute your soda sorb and, it, and that will cease to work. And then you'll get a shot of caustic soda when you try to take a breath. Instead of getting a, a breathable breath, you'll get a shot of caustic soda in your mouth. Not had that happen, but I know people who have. I did have a rebreather flood. On, a, on an earlier rebreather that I owned, it wasn't this brand, and uh, that one was sort of uh, a problematic for flooding. So um, this one, see, they seem to have licked that. And even if you do get water in this one, you can dewater it on the fly, which is a pretty neat feature. And I couldn't do on my first one. So that pretty much covers all of the components. You know, the plenum, the scrubber, the spacer, the two cylinder gas cylinders, the rebreathing loop the counter lungs and the head and the regulators are all the component pieces. So what can happen? What can cause a diver to have a, a, an emergency using a device like this? Most common one is hypoxia. You let the breathing mixture go, get out of whack, get become hypoxic and wind up having uh, you know, a loss of consciousness as a result of, uh, of uh, hypoxia, in which case you'd mouthpiece would just fall out of your mouth, you'd drift away in the current, nobody would ever see again. So that's a bad thing, you don't want to let that happen. Um, hypercarbia, I mentioned if the scrubber ceases to gather, uh, or if you've used it too long, or you or you had bad soda sorb, uh, or you didn't pack the canister right, you could get too much CO2 in the loop. And I've, I've had friends that have had a CO2 hit, I personally have not. Um, and uh, they, they said that it made them really paranoid and uh, panicky and they knew there was something happening they could kind of sense it however there are some schools of thought that say you know you might not have any warning at all you might just have a grand mal seizure underwater once again the result is the the mouthpiece falls out of your mouth you drift away in the current nobody ever sees you again so that's a bad a bad thing to have happen as well uh, the caustic cocktail uh, ha is a bailout emergency that you, you would go to bailout cylinder at that point um, certainly but if you have water that winds up in here, you can sense that it's there because you can hear it gurgling and, and uh, you can kind of hear it. You, it. A good rebreather diver does not allow to let water get into his unit that he has any control over. Now, if uh, an O-ring failed or some kind of a, another leak uh, happened, uh, there, you might not have much, to, much uh, say in the deal. So uh, you'd have to go to a bailout gas source. Any good rebreather diver never goes in the water with just this system. You would always have at least a, at least a 40 of scuba gas with a regular regulator that he could switch to that would be in a no decompression dive in a decompression dive you you're limited in that dive by the amount of, of uh, bailout gas that you can either stage along your route or carry with you so and i'm talking carrying sometimes full-size scuba tanks on a clip harness with a regulator that you may never use on the dive hopefully uh, and uh, but we're there to bail out to should something uh, 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 fail on this you have a malfunction with this unit regulator malfunction a, a one-way valve malfunction um, you ran yourself out of gas god forbid um, a gas loss emergency where a hose or something broke behind you on the regulator and you you know you, you couldn't that made that regulator unusable there's a, a whole host of things that can happen where this thing can become baggage and if it does you need to have bailout gas uh, ready to go at all times enough to get you through your decompression obligation and back to the surface there's no no varying on that rule so just to recap then the emergencies that a diver could have with this is hypoxia low oxygen hyperoxia 
high oxygen. Hypercapnia or hypercarbia, that's too much CO2 in the breathing mixture. Caustic cocktail, when seawater floods the unit and gets into the soda sorb and changes it into caustic soda, and the diver then inhales a, a lungful, God forbid, of caustic soda or mouthful, which is very unpalatable. Uh, a gas, out of gas emergency, where uh, either they've had a, 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 a mechanical malfunction that the gas got out of the unit, somehow broken hose, uh, bad O-ring, failed burst disc in the valve, or they just flat ran themselves out of gas, which should never happen, especially on a rebreather. Um, a me mechanical malfunction with the rebreather that makes it unusable, flood, uh, some other kind of mechanical failure. Uh, these are all things that can happen. Uh, they, they're pretty rare, but it's not outside the realm of possibilities that you could get called down to the beach and you could uh, come across a diver that has a rebreather on. Um, I would uh, suggest if that be the case that you uh, that you obviously get them out of the water get them out of their equipment make a, a primary and secondary survey and then uh, you treat supportively uh, always 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 uh, ventilating if appropriate uh, early and often uh, and make sure that you get uh, you get them to definitive care at the closest emergency room uh, that you can uh, they will tell you that, oh no, they need to go to uh, the chamber. Well, that, that's not really true. What they need to be is medically, medically supported and stabilized in, a, in, a, in an emergency room. And if a chamber ride is, in, is indicated, then uh, they'll get them to the chamber and make that happen. Uh, closest chamber we have here in the Tacoma area is, uh, is at Virginia Mason Hospital up in Seattle. So it's not a, a short trip. Um, and if the patient uh, has other problems, lung, lung expansion injury, uh, decompression syndrome, uh, arterial gas embolism, uh, near drowning, uh, any of those things need to be treated uh, supportively first and then treated in the chamber. Uh, uh, mild case of the bends there again, not a, not a quick, you know, hurry up, run four bell emergency up there. Bad case of the bends. If they're stable in every other regard, then they can get off to the chamber. But uh, uh, those are the things that you might see uh, if you're ever asked to deal with a rebreather diver.